Welcome to World Mycotoxin Report Impact 2022, a webinar brought to you by DSM Animal Nutrition and Health and Romer Labs. My name is Josh Davis and I'm the Communications Manager at Romer Labs. It's nice to be here again with you. And this time is a little bit different as we have several firsts to celebrate. One of them is that we're presenting this webinar to you for the first time as DSM. Not only is Romer Labs a part of DSM, Biomin has also been fully integrated into DSM Animal Nutrition and Health. So before we start, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce today's speakers. Anneliese Müller, Global Product Manager for Mycotoxin Risk Management at DSM. She's responsible for the global survey. And also with us today is Nora Kogalnik, Product Manager at Romer Labs. So a fine welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anneliese, you were here last year to present the mycotoxin survey. Now, a lot has happened since then, hasn't it? Hi. Yes, that's certainly true. So we are now part of a new business line, the Performance Solutions and Biomin, within the DSM Animal Nutrition and Health Group. We are focusing on improving the sustainability and profitability of animal farming, and it's great to be one team. This also means that the Biomin World Mycotoxin Survey has a new home and a new name now, the DSM World Mycotoxin Survey. And we're going to be hearing a lot about the survey, of course, in just a few minutes. But first, let me also bring Nora into the conversation just a little bit. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm fine. Tell us, what have you, what have you prepared for us today? What will you be talking about? First of all, it's nice to be here. Today, I'll be saying a thing or two about the important roles that sampling and sample preparation play in achieving accurate mycotoxin testing results. So thank you, we're all looking forward to hearing about that as well. Now, I promised several firsts to you. Um, yes, this is, as you can see, the first time that we are doing this in a studio, but more importantly, for the first time, more mycotoxin experts will be joining us later to focus on individual regions, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, Asia Pacific, and thirdly, the Americas. As always, you can ask questions at any time during the webinar. We will answer all your questions afterwards by email. This doesn't mean that we won't be hearing from you now, though. Several of you asked questions when you registered, and these questions will inform our discussion after the presentations. So with this, I think we're ready to go. What can you tell us about the current picture of mycotoxin occurrence, Annalisa? There's a lot to say, but I want to start with giving you a global presentation of the mycotoxin survey data 2021. The mycotoxin survey is part of the technical services we offer to our customers. We collect data from their feed material samples to help them understand which mycotoxins are found at which concentrations and the potential threat to their animals. In 2021, we counted over 24,000 samples and over 112,500 analyses have been made to detect the six my main mycotoxins in different raw commodities and in finished feed from over 75 countries. The already high number of over 112,000 analyses performed refers only to the detection of the six main well-known mycotoxins. When we consider multi-mycotoxin analysis that we offer, the overall number of analyses will be much higher. Well, let's have a look at the worldwide contamination. Let me explain how to read this map. For all of the subregions, we listed the prevalence for the main six mycotoxins analyzed in the boxes. You can see how many samples tested positive for aflatoxins, for serolinone, deoxynivalinol, T2 toxin, fumonisins, and ochratoxin A. In this world map, the subregions are colored according to the overall risk due to mycotoxin contamination in all of the samples in this subregion. Yellow means that the risk is moderate, orange that risk is high, going up to severe in dark orange and reaching extreme indicated in red. So how do we decide in this, on this risk indication? We define risk thresholds for the different species and the different mycotoxins. This is based on worldwide practical experience, on field trials, on scientific publications and regulations. And if mycotoxin concentrations exceed these risk thresholds, this can already have negative effects on the health of animals. Depending now on how many samples exceed these risk thresholds, we do our coloring scheme, scheme of the map. So if more than, if less than 25% of the samples um, contain a mycotoxin above this risk threshold, we will indicate this with moderate risk in yellow. If more than 75% of the samples 
contain mycotoxin at the concentration above this risk threshold, we will indicate this as extreme risk in red. And what we can see is that most regions and subregions are at severe risk. It's North, Central and South America, Central and Southern Europe, as well as Middle East and Northern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Africa. In Eastern Europe and Northern Europe, we see a bit reduced risk, but still a high risk. And moving more to the East, we can see that China and Taiwan, as well as South Asia, are at extreme risk. In East Asia and Southeast Asia, risk is severe. And as last year, risk in Oceania is moderate. Let's take a global overview of all of the samples. And here we can see that 61% of the samples are contaminated with a mycotoxin at the concentration that can already harm the animal, the health and the performance of the animal. Therefore, we consider global risk as severe. In 64% of all the samples that have been measured, which have been measured for more than three mycotoxins, we can see that more than one mycotoxin was found. So the co-contamination is very high. And this means um, that it can even have a more detrimental effect on the animal health because of possible synergistic effect of the multiple mycotoxins. What is now influencing the occurrence of mycotoxins? Fungi can produce mycotoxins on the crop in the field and during storage. The development of the fungi is strongly dependent on weather conditions during critical times in plant development, such as flowering, and also during harvesting. The temperature, the hours of rain, all this is crucial. And furthermore, environmental stress has a significant consequence on fungi infection. If plants already struggle with difficult conditions, their defenses against fungi can be less effective. Environmental stressors can be floods, droughts, but also insect attacks. And there is a lot of evidence that extreme weather events, which are on the rise due to climate change, cause stress and are a main trigger for mycotoxin occurrence. I was just very briefly looking for extreme weather events in the last year. And as I'm living in Central Europe, of course, I had in mind the heavy flooding in Central Europe, in Germany, Austria, Belgium, the Netherlands and Switzerland. But those extreme weather events um, also occurred in Americas and in Asia. Well, thanks for these insights, Anneliese. And for our audience, you mentioned at the beginning the many analyses that you're doing with multi-mycotoxin methods. Uh, will you discuss this in greater detail later? Yes, additionally to looking at the six main mycotoxins, a selection of our samples is analyzed for over 50 and some even for over 500 different mycotoxins and metabolites. And those results will be also included in our mycotoxin survey report. Great. Well, thank you for that. But, uh, before, but first, we're going to hear a little bit more about mycotoxin risk in Asia Pacific. And for this, I want to introduce Bettina bela wöchtel Global Product Manager in Mycotoxin Risk Management. So let's start with a short overview summarizing findings from the whole Asian Pacific region and all commodities. As indicated in the map on the slide, livestock in South Asian countries is under extreme risk of mycotoxin exposure. This was also true in 2020. In the rest of Asian region, the risk stays constantly severe. The risk in Oceania is same as last year, moderate. The prevalence of all major mycotoxins, so aflatoxins, seralenone, deoxynivalenol, T2, formonisins and ochratoxin in Asia is higher than in 2020, except for the prevalence of formonisins, which is constantly high with 81%. The most prevalent mycotoxin in 2021 in Asia is formonisin, followed by deoxynivalenol and serolinone. Especially the detected DON levels and prevalence pose a risk for sensitive species, but also concentrations and prevalence of formonisins and serolinone. At the first glance, aflatoxin contamination does not seem to be such a big problem because the prevalence is relatively low, but the average contamination of the positively tested samples 
is high with 47 ppb. Corn is an important commodity regarding mycotoxin contamination also in Asia. For money seasons, Okuin 91% and Don in 83% of corn samples. Now, after this rough overview, I want to share some highlights with you. First, a short explanation. On top of the slide, you see the number of samples tested for the respective mycotoxin. You see also the average contamination of the positively tested samples, as well as the maximum level found. In the figures be below, you see uh, one figure uh, showing the prevalence of the major mycotoxins. On the second figure, you see the percentage of either uncontaminated samples, samples contaminated with a single mycotoxin, and samples contaminated with more than one mycotoxin. This co-contamination is of special importance. The risk for health and performance can potentially, potentially increase because of additive and synergistic effects of the mycotoxins. But now let's start with the highlights. In Indian finished feed, you see that nearly all samples are contaminated with aflatoxins. The average contamination of finished feed with aflatoxin is 39 ppp. This clearly exceeds our risk thresholds as well as regulatory limits, for example, in the European Union. Also, fumonisins and ochratoxins are very prevalent. 100% of the analyzed samples are contaminated with at least two mycotoxins. In China, corn and corn-derived commodities strongly contribute to the toxin burden. In corn grain, we see high prevalences of sen, serolinone, deoxynivalenol, formonisins and ochratoxins. Aflatoxins are less prevalent, but the average of positive samples is very high with 80 ppp, and the maximum concentration found, this is more than 1000 ppp, is extreme. The values are also extremely high for serolinone, deoxynivalenol and formonisins. These findings are also somehow reflected in the finished feed sampled in Chinese feed. Again, average levels of contamination are potentially harmful and the maximum levels are extreme, with 206 ppp for aflatoxins, 7205 ppp for serolinone, nearly 6000 ppp for deoxynivalenol and nearly 30,000 ppp for formonisins. As mentioned before, in the eastern part and the southeastern part of Asia, the risk is not extreme but still severe. So let's have a closer look on country level. In Indonesian corn kernels, the prevalence of aflatoxins and formonisins is very high and the average aflatoxin levels are extremely high. Serolinone and Don are less prevalent, but the levels in individual samples are potentially harmful. In Thailand, formonisins are the biggest issue in corn. The prevalence is 100% and the maximum levels found nearly 12,000 ppp. For East Asia, we identified corn silage to be of special interest. Serolinone, deoxynivalenol and formonisin levels are potentially harmful for productivity and health of livestock. This depends, of course, on the amount of silage eaten by the animals. Same as in 2020, the total risk in Othania is moderate. The date, data we gain from analysis of corn silage from this subregion indicate a risk of serolinone and deoxynivalenol exposure. The average levels of serolinone are higher than 1000 ppp. But as you see, the total sample size is very small with 
12 samples of corn silage and therefore may not be representative. So to sum our findings up, the corn-derived commodities contribute very much to the overall risk of mycotoxin exposure in Asia. This is not only true for commodities harvested in 2021, but for the last decade. As visualized in the slide, there are constantly high percentages of contamination for fusarium uh, toxins, deoxynivalenol, formonicins and serolinol, whereas there is a bit more fluctuation in prevalence of aflatoxins over the year. Interestingly, the prevalence of ochratoxin was strongly increased in the last two years compared to the eight years before. This is similar for T2, which is a highly toxic substance belonging to the atrichotocenes. Of course, we need to monitor this trend, if the trend continues in the next years or if the prevalence maybe is decreasing again. Today, I focused very much on corn and corn-derived commodities because of the very high risk the beer and the frequent use. Please be aware that not only corn bears a risk. An example for another important commodity is soybean. Seralenone can be found in more than half of Asian soybean samples. And this, of course, also contributes to the overall toxin burden. Also, aflatoxin levels are very high in soybean. So don't ignore this commodity. So, these were some insights I wanted to share with you for this region. If you have more questions, or if your country of interest or your community of interest was not included in my talk, please feel free to contact us and we will come back to you as soon as possible to give you the information you need. Thank you for this detailed information about mycotoxin occurrence. And with this, I want to shift our focus a bit and hear from Romer Labs and product manager Nora Kogelnik, who's joining us again. Hi, Nora. Hi, Tosh. So thousands of samples went into making the results for the World Mycotoxin Survey. But let's step back a little bit and have a look at what it takes to get to these results. So how do we get from a specific lot of grain to precise, accurate, and representative result of its mycotoxin concentration? Thanks, Josh. That's a good question. And it takes us to the heart what we do at Roma Labs. First of all, let me explain what precise, accurate and representative mean. Precision is about the degree of closeness of measurements with each other, without regard to how the results relate to the actual mycotoxin concentration. In a worst case scenario, you get precise results that are off target, as in the target on the upper right. Accuracy refers to the closeness of the measurements to the target reference value, hence, a result can be neither precise nor accurate or precise but not accurate and the other way around. There are a lot of things we have to keep in mind to make sure our results are both accurate and precise and it all begins with understanding a few basics about representative sampling. Sampling is crucial for any kind of mycotoxin testing as 88% of result deviation can come from sampling. The reason is that mycotoxins are unevenly distributed in any given grouping of grain. The main objective of sampling is to get a representative sample. Samples used for analysis should have the same average concentration as for example an entire 50 ton truckload. The sample for analysis is very small, 10 to 50 grams. Now, which factors can influence the testing variability when it comes to mycotoxin testing? Sampling and sample preparation are complex processes and harbor pitfalls. Each step within sample preparation process introduces a level of variability that contributes to the total variability within a single analytical result. A variety of studies have shown that the sampling contributes to the highest total uncertainty of around 76%, while the analysis itself just accounts for 3%. This highlights the importance of introducing an accurate sampling plan. Over the next few minutes, I would like to explain you a bit why mycotoxins are often hard to sample for. 
I'll also share with you a few easy steps you can use to get an accurate result. In general, just a small portion of the whole grain lot could be contaminated with mycotoxin-producing fungi. To help you imagine how small the percentage of contamination is, I will give you an example. We call it the BBB problem. BBB stands for parts per billion. One BBB is equal to one gram of sugar in a swimming pool or a grain of sand in 22 kilogram. Now you understand how small this amount is and why it's difficult to detect. To receive results representative of your whole grain lot, you need a way to take a sample that is representative of the original lot. Grain kernels contaminated with mycotoxins are not homogeneously distributed and mycotoxins are often grouped together. These clusters of contaminated kernels are known as hotspots. This is why any sampling plan must be set up to account for the random distribution of such hotspots. A larger number of samples, known as incremental samples, is taken from various locations distributed throughout the lot. The selection of the incremental samples ensures that all grains have an equal chance of being selected. What you see here on the right is the typical shape of an operating curve used to evaluate the bias risk, which we in the analytical world call as fo a false negative and seller's risk as false positive. What does this tell us? All sampling plants will have some kind of sampling error. Bias or consumer's risk describes the probability of a defined sampling plan allowing a batch to be accepted despite the batch exceeding the threshold for contamination. The seller's or producer's risk is that a good batch within acceptable levels of mycotoxin concentration will be misidentified as a bad batch. For comparison, the figure on the left is an illustration of what a poorly theoretically operating curve for an error-free sampling plan looks like. Regulations such as the one you see here from the European Union define the number of incremental sample and other parameters to reduce risk for buyers and sellers. Now you have completed the sampling, what comes next? A good sample needs good sample preparation before you jump into the analysis. So let's look at why sample preparation is important. Mycotoxin producing molds have several different routes of contamination, meaning that mycotoxin can be found on the surface of grains as well as inside them. Fusarium, for example, grows within the kernel, while Aspergillus grows on the surface. This is why we grind. It breaks the kernels to ensure an even distribution of particles. This improves our ability to detect contaminated particles. So, let's say that we now have our 2 kg sample. Now, we are, we are confronted with another problem. You cannot test all 2 kg. This is why we take smaller subportions of the whole ground sample that we use for the actual test. That's another reason why it is important to have a homogeneous sample. In the last part, I would like to explain why the particle size matters. Here we see the results of a study on the effect of particle size on test results. For the study, samples of corn contaminated with aflatoxin were taken and ground to different sizes using different mesh sieves. To evaluate the effect of particle size, different sample volumes, 5 g, 10 g, 20 g, were taken and then analyzed with HPLC and SMS. We calculated the relative standard deviation or coefficient of variation to determine how dissimilar the results were. The lower the standard deviation, the less variation within the data set and the more reliable the result. The study shows that the particle size significantly impacts the coefficient of variation. The lowest CV was reached with a 10 gram sample of which 97% passes through a number 30 mesh. So, what does this mean for you? Keep your grain size small, your sample size large and your mycotoxin results accurate. Okay, you have collected samples from your lot. You have now your homogeneous subsamples. What comes next? You extract your sample and test the extraction. And I'm here to tell you that mycotoxin testing does not need to be slow or complicated. In this final part of my talk, I would like to show you how simple the extraction and analysis of mycotoxin tests can be. While sampling and sample preparation proved crucial for securing accurate and reliable results, 
Testing is not less important, especially when we have a look at the challenges grain traders, millers or feed millers face. Just think of how busy it can get at grain reception points, especially during busy harvest times, when incoming raw materials need to be tested quickly and as simply as possible, while still maintaining high standards of analytical accuracy. A mycotoxin test kit needs to check several boxes. Fast, robust, to withstand the toughest of condition at reception points. Sensitive enough to meet the regulations for food and feed. One that provides accurate and precise results. And by all means, simple to use. At Roma Labs, our focus in the last years was to enable just that. The result was the Argos Strip Pro Vortex test system we launched last year. Customers from around the world confirm that it really does all that and more. Agastrip Provortex is the ideal solution to test raw materials on site for Afla, Don, Son, Fum and Ota. You can see many of the benefits of the system here, but I'll just mention a couple. It has a quick sample preparation, an assay time of just 4 minutes and the capacity to test 4 samples at once. And most importantly, we eliminated errors with a common extraction and dilution and a very intuitive walk-away operation. You can learn more about Agostripo Vortex at romalabs.com and with that, I'll hand it back over to you, Josh. Thank you, Nora. Now, once a good sample has been taken, there are several different analytical methods to choose from. So now we're going to turn from rapid testing solutions to LCMS MS-based solutions. Yes, I want to focus on multi-mycotoxin methods in our last segments, all based on LCMS MS, the advantages those methods have and what we can learn from them. So as an example, the Spectrum Top 50 method, it was developed by Roma Labs and was introduced to the market in 2018. In that year, we had around 500 samples, 570 samples analyzed. Now in 2021, we have analyzed over 3,400 samples worldwide. So we have a good data set helping us to learn about the occurrence of many different mycotoxins and metabolites. For many of you, this will be already familiar, but I want to explain it a bit for those who have not heard of it. The Spectrum Top 50 method is a multi-mycotoxin analysis method measuring over 50 mycotoxins, emerging mycotoxins and masked mycotoxins in one run. After the sample is received, it takes five working days until you get the results. And this is of course longer than rapid quick tests, but this method has other advantages. The analysis for single mycotoxins can underestimate the synergistic detrimental effects of mycotoxins on animal health and performance. Our long-term monitoring of mycotoxins in different commodities shows that co-occurrence is the rule and not the exception. I will show some examples later. Further, this method is very sensitive to detect moderate concentrations of mycotoxins and additionally analysis of finished feed is possible. Detected are the main and frequently occurring mycotoxins, so aflatoxins, serolinone and its metabolites, several A trichotisines, the best well-known one T2 toxin, several B trichotisines, the best well-known one deoxynivalenol, further fumonisins, ochrotoxins and several ergot alkaloids, and additionally masked mycotoxins and emerging mycotoxins and other secondary metabolites are detected. Now, what are emerging mycotoxins? They are frequently found on agricultural commodities, they lack regulation, and their to toxicity is still under investigation. But some scientific studies already suggested toxic effects. Also, the European Food Safety Authority started to publish some reports on some of the emerging mycotoxins, so showing interest in their occurrence and effects. Now, coming to the masked mycotoxins, um, they get their name because they cannot be detected by conventional quick analysis methods. It's best to explain this with an example, deoxynivalenol, when the fungi infects a plant and produces this mycotoxin, the plant can, as a defense mechanism, attach a sugar molecule to deoxynivalenol, which is then the mast form, it's DON3 glucoside. Once this mast form is, um, is digested, and comes to the intestinal tract of the animal. The sugar molecule is cleaved again and the original deoxynivalenol is present and it can have harmful effects on the animal health. 
up to 45% of total dioxinivalenol in serial samples can be present as DON3 glucoside. Well, let's have a look at the results of all top 50 analyses done in 2021. On this slide, you can see the mycotoxins listed according to their abundance. And to the right, we can see the average of positives concentration and the maximum levels. On top is the mycotoxin found most often, which was dioxinivalenol in 60% of the samples. It is colored in orange, which indicates, um, this color indicates the regulated and guideline mycotoxins. We also see fumonisins and serolenone, so the usual suspects. In red, you can now see the masked mycotoxins and in blue, the emerging mycotoxins. Still among the top five in the list is DON3-glucoside found in almost every second sample. Also indicated in red are modified mycotoxins, F15 and 3-acetyl-dioxinivalenol. Those are metabolites of DON produced by fungi and again in the gastrointestinal tract, they can be reconverted to the original form of dioxinivalenol. In blue, you see the emergent mycotoxins. And here we can see that monoliformine was the most frequently found, followed by bovaricine, alternariol, and eniatines. So what would we know about effects of those very frequently found emergent mycotoxins? Monoliformine, um, for this toxin, broilers have been suggested to be very susceptible. It can be genotoxic and have negative effects, particularly to the heart and also muscular weakness. Respiratory distress and immunosuppression have been described. Bovaricine and eniatines showed negative effect on the immune system. And alternariol showed no acute toxicity, but chronic exposure still needs to be investigated. I want to show you one more example of corn silage samples from Poland. Um, this was around 40 samples, so not that many. And we can see the emerging mycotoxins, eniatines and monoliformine very frequently. Eniatine B and B1 are even found in every sample. And what is interesting to see here, it's the high occurrence of the different trichotisines within the samples. So dioxinivalenol was detected in all of the samples with a very high concentration. We see again in red the mask modified mycotoxin DON3 glucoside and 15 acetyl dioxinivalenol. And we found nivalenol in 68% of the samples. So what I want to say in mentioning all those toxins that with measuring only dioxinivalenol, we will underestimate the total concentration of trichotisines in these samples. The same is true for the A trichotisines. We found T2 toxin, but at a much higher prevalence, we found HT2 toxin, a metabolite of T2 toxin. It was found in 84% of the samples at the very high average concentration of 200 ppb. So measuring only T2 toxin will underestimate the toxic load the animal is exposed to. Now we are happy that we can offer another multi-mycotoxin method the most advanced and comprehensive method out there developed and perform, performed by our cooperation partners at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences. We call it the Spectrum 380 analysis method. This method detects over 500 different mycotoxins and metabolites, as well as bacterial and plant toxins and metabolites. This is not a routine analysis, but it's used in special cases where we cannot find the cause of a problem in a farm. And additionally, it is a commitment to research to get um, a better picture of the risk that is lying ahead. During the last year, 860 samples were analyzed with this method. We can see that co-contamination is very common. If we look at the graph on the left, we can see on the x-axis the metabolites per sample detected. And on the y-axis, we can see the proportion of samples in percent. And here, then we can see that in 21% of the samples, we found over 60 different metabolites and on average per sample, 42 metabolites. Besides all those mycotoxin analysis methods, we offer our mycotoxin prediction tool. It predicts the risk of mycotoxin contamination in the upcoming harvest. This tool is available for corn harvest, 
predicting risk of contamination with aflatoxins, deoxynebolinol, fumonisins, and serolinone. And for wheat, for the toxins deoxynebolinol and serolinone. It was developed in close cooperation with universities and relies on models of plant and fungal growth, models of mycotoxin production, crop data and very important a detailed weather forecast. Models are adapted with the huge data set of our mycotoxin survey. We hope this tool helps our customers to consider mycotoxin risk in advance and make informed decisions. It does not replace mycotoxin testing though. Our, mic our predictions start in March for the Northern Hemisphere and go until October when we switch to the Southern Hemisphere. Here predictions start from October on until March. Currently, we are focusing on predictions for the second corn harvest in South America. Now we have seen our tools to analyze and detect mycotoxins and even to look at mycotoxin risk in advance. We also offer solutions to counteract the negative effects of mycotoxin contamination on animals. As we know that mycotoxins have a very different structure, it needs several strategies to detoxify them. With this in mind, we offer to the market the well-known Microfix product line that works with three strategies, adsorption, biotransformation and bioprotection. Adsorption biobentonide is a proven solution. It has gone through the full process of EU authorization for binding aflatoxins. Then we have biotransformation components containing the purified enzyme Fumzyme for the degradation of fumonisins the microorganism BBSH for the breakdown of trichotisines, both authorized by the EU. Senzyme is a new purified enzyme biotransforming serolinone into non-toxic metabolites and the MTV component counteracting ochrotoxins. On top of this, the product contains the bioprotection components which are supporting liver health and immune system of the animal as well as the gastrointestinal barrier. The Microfix product line is the most advanced tool for mycotoxin control. For more information about our product, please contact a DSM representative. We're almost at the end of this webinar, but we don't want to stop without hearing a little bit about what's on our audience's mind. Now, Nora and Anneliese, you've seen some of the questions that members of the audience have asked. Um, let's start with you, Anneliese. Which question particularly caught your attention? One of the questions that particularly caught my attention is, um, can you please explain synergistic effects of mycotoxins? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very good question. And synergistic effects, it means that if multiple mycotoxins occur, the effects on the animal will not be the sum of the individual toxins, but it will be a higher effect. So if we put it in math, which is easier to, to explain, 2 plus 3 would not be 5, but would be more than 5. OK, so this means that if you have two mycotoxins with synergistic effects, that means that uh, whatever effects they have individually, right, when they're together, it's going to be more than just what those two effects are. Yeah, exactly. All right. All right. Tricky topic, synergistic effects, right? But uh, always want, we get a lot of questions about this every year, it seems. Right, something that's definitely on our audience's mind. Um, so, uh, Nora, what question, uh, which question stood out to you? Um, one question that caught my eye was if Agastri Provortex can be used on matrices which has not been validated yet. Aha. I cannot recommend to use a test kit on a matrix which is not validated. Why is that? I would then contact a SOS representative and then we can do a matrix check um, to see if the test kit is working on that type of sample. Is this because of the problems with matrix effects? Yes, it is. So each matrix um, behaves different on the test strip and therefore we have to see um, in our laboratory um, how the sample works on our lateral flow devices. All right, all right. We get also get a lot of questions about matrix effects, so True. thank you. Thank you. Yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's certainly a perennial favorite. Um, all right, and I think we have time for just one more question. Um, I'll just throw it back to you, Anneliese. Was there anything else that stood out to you? Any other question you'd like to yeah, like just one other question because we had a focus on this toxin in the last time. It's about serolinone and how mm. does it affect animals, ruminants, pigs and poultry. And because time is short already, I want to focus on pig, which is the most sensitive species for this mycotoxin. Um, serolinone, it can interact with the receptors, with the estrogenic receptors and thus cause an estrogenic effect in the animal. So it's mainly affecting the reproductive system 
And in pigs, this can range from um, a shifted estrus to reduced weight of the offspring. It can um, influence the morphology of the uterus and the ovaries. It can lead to a swollen vulva, but also in boars, it can have an effect like reduced sperm motility. So it's really affecting all the reproductive system of the animal. All right. Well, thank you very much. And with that, we're approaching the end of our webinar. As usual, you'll be receiving a few goodies from us. You'll receive an email including links to today's recording, the brand new DSM Mycotoxin Survey Annual Report, the latest issue of Spot On from Rummer Labs, and a link to a short on-site mycotoxin testing video within the next 24 hours. You'll be prompted to answer a short survey on today's webinar. It should take about two minutes to complete. By providing your feedback, you allow us to improve our webinar program and identify future topics for discussion. We would appreciate your taking the time to complete the survey. It remains for me to thank our speakers, Anneliese Müller from DSM. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also, great thanks to my colleague, Nora Kobelnik from Romer Labs. Thank you, Tosh. This is Joshua Davis from Romer Labs saying, visit us at dsm.com slash ANH or romerlabs.com to learn more about how we can help you develop a mycotoxin detection and management strategy tailored to your needs. Thanks for your attention and your interest, and have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.